everyone. Welcome to another edition of In Conversation. Today we have with us Dr. P.S. Vora, an author and financial thinker. He's also a columnist on Indian and international financial affairs with major national newspapers. Dr. Vora is a PhD degree holder in accounting and finance. He has authored six books and has written over 65 research articles for reputed research journals. In his academic career spanning nearly two decades, he has taught financial management to many MBA students at various colleges and universities for over 13 years. Dr. Vora is a much sought after speaker at universities and also a panelist in various news channels. He has also presented papers at various national and international conferences. For the last six years, he is the director of a reputed CBSE school in Bikaner in India's Rajasthan state. Dr. Vora is a well-known name in school education for introducing an entrepreneurship course and sell at the school level. He recently published a book in Hindi titled Arthik Safarnama, which is, an, which is interesting for the many lessons that it offers. So let's get to know more about the book and its background from the man himself. Welcome, Dr. Vora. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Anita Ji. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, now, Dr. Vora, you've interacted and studied uh, a variety of entrepreneur segments for your book. Yeah. So some of them are in the informal sector that they or, uh, that you've uh, you know interacted with. So what are the key takeaways from these segments, in your opinion, with regard to financial and business management, and the key lessons from their life? Uh, see, I tell you first, uh, I'm so thankful to you that uh, I'm in a platform and uh, we are talking together. And uh, like you know, you have introduced me. And you have also introduced my book, right? You know, uh, I can show to your audience that this is my latest book, right? You know, this is uh, this Arthik Safar Nama. Like I've just recently I've written last uh, week only. It came in media. Uh, it came in market, and uh, I'm really happy. I'm really feeling good to update you that this book is getting good response across the society. Thank you very much once again to giving me the opportunity. Pleasure. Pleasure. And uh, Anita, as you asked me that you know that about the informal sector. Uh, See, I tell you, like, I'm, uh, I started writing for newspapers, like, uh, uh, from 2020, I started writing, you know, uh, and it's uh, been three years constantly that I'm working, and uh, informal sector is very close to me, because, uh, honestly, I'm going to confess you that, you know, uh, when this lockdown started in COVID, right, and uh, I witnessed huge crowd on Indian roads, like just after four hours announcement when our honorable PM, he announced that by 12 noon, 12 night, right, uh, lockdown, will, lockdown will be imposed. And we we saw next few days, like roads were, you know, with, with you know, huge crowd. So I felt very strange and I didn't understand that, you know, uh, that, you know, uh, like why this crowd is there, like, you know, I was just feeling that my country is doing so good, right, when we are really, you know, uh, we are we are we are the fastest developing country. Then I really realized that in this country, uh, I started. I wanted to know something, right? And then then this informal sector or unorganized sector, uh, it came to my mind, and uh, I researched on them. I started understanding them that what are actually their issues, uh, what they do the right now, and how they are doing it right now. And uh, I've written uh, many newspaper articles for them. And, and and just, you know, when this thought came to my mind that let's uh, write a book, right, you know, and I tell you that uh, from last one and a half year, right, I've given, uh, I've given one and a half year time to the sector uh, in, into different locations to understand that how they are doing it. And now, I've, I've, suppose I come to your question and you ask me that what are my, my takes for uh, this informal sector? Uh, I tell you, Anita Ji, like, you know, uh, in my country, in India, right, you know, I suppose we talk about the total labor strength. I tell you the 90% they belong to informal sector. And in absolute number, they are 42 crore. And the another part which you will, you know, you will feel uh, very strange to know that the 70% population of villages, they belong to informal sector. So, therefore, like, this is very important segment to understand. 
uh, if there is a person who comes to a society and he is doing something electrician, he's he's sort of the electrician, right? He's into informal sector. If you find a person, you know, uh, like who's selling vegetables, he's into informal sector. If you're find if you're seeing a person like who's selling, you know, uh, roadside some food items, he's into informal sector. If you find a uh, plumber, he's into informal sector. If you find a, a, a shopkeeper like, you know, who's selling, you know, uh, a few items near to your places, right? Grocery items or something else, right? You know, uh, they are into informal sector. So then I went into research and I, I got some data and that data told me that into our cities, into urban areas of India, right? You know, uh, the 30% the people they get employment from informal sector only. And out of those 30% people, 50% uh, they are living, they are, they are, they are living with their day-to-day -day struggle, right? Whatever they earn, they use that money for their day-to-day -day life, right? You know? So it actually attracted me and uh, it, it gave me uh, an input to understand uh, that, you know, uh, what is their real lifestyle. So in my, this book, uh, I have personally interviewed uh, many category people, many people from different categories, and uh, I got their observations and I noted down and uh, finally I've given them my words and I'm very sure uh, if suppose you will read this book, you will find uh, emotions from them, for them, right? You know, you will get to know that how tough their lifestyle is. Right. Uh, that, that's a very interesting point that you raised, the emotions and the, and the, you know, the encounters that they have every day, the, tough, the, the toughness of their existence. That's a very um, um, relevant um, and interesting point, and that'll resonate with the readers, I'm sure. Um, now, um, corporate India has a structured financial management system strategy and well-trained people from tier one institutions and globally acclaimed top universities, as we all know. At the same time, the people that you focused in your book have an informal approach at, to, fi uh, to financial management, and they may not come from such prestigious universities either. Their strategy and business acumen and management style comes from their own experience, interactions, and backgrounds. Now, do you think that corporates who are well-trained are better placed in terms of bringing better financial results uh, how do you compare uh, the advantages versus disadvantages for, uh, you know, uh, across both sectors, both the informal and the corporate sectors? A uh, very interesting question. <laughs> and, uh, I tell you, like, uh, see, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is really tough for me just to uh, absolutely tell you the, the differences, right? But I will, I will just explain that, you know, uh, what are my findings, right? You know, what are the outputs what I have observed into uh, my thought process, into my research. See, uh, India is the far, fifth, fifth uh, developing, fifth uh, largest country of the world right now, last year only, you know, uh, with, uh, we are right now with $4 trillion economy, right? Uh, Japan, Germany, and China, and US, they are still away from India, right? They are far away from India, right? I suppose I say to you that, you know, but I, I, I feel that uh, we have been with 75 years history also with us. And still, if suppose Indian economy is struggling because, you know, we are more on imports, we are less on exports. Our manufacturing sector, they are not doing very good, right? You know, we are absolutely, uh, we are very good into service sector, suppose. And we started our economy, we started our, you know, after independence, we we started doing something good with the agriculture sector, right? Uh, the point that what you asked me, I feel that, you know, to large extent, our education system, we have got failed to give a best mentoring to informal sectors or unorganized sectors compared to the corporate people. As you said very rightly that the tier one cities or the top corporate houses, they are recruiting the people from the prestigious universities like IITs or IIMs, right? So undoubtedly, they are getting the best human capital. And the small business houses, I'm not like, like who are into informal or I'm suppose I say to you, the MSMEs, right? The small medium enterprises or like, you know, the small business houses, right? You know, they are still with the one line leadership only, one line leadership only. And 
I have found in my study, I have found into my research that they don't have the motive of the expansion. They are getting profits. They are in the profit, right? You know, they are not in the losses, right? They are doing good. But the problem is that when we look at the different perspective or like, you know, when we look at the uh, Indian economy, right, you know, yes, they are contributing to large extent, but we need the corporate, we need their big, you know, we need that they, they shall have the different horizon. Unfortunately, they are not doing it. The reason is that they don't have the best human capital. And I, I take it as a challenge that I give this, this, uh, this issue to the education system. Education system has got failed to monitor them. And very straight away, I'm talking to you, I'm answering you that, you know, small business houses or informal sectors, they are doing business for sake of doing business. They are not doing business scientifically. They are not able to, to calculate or forecast or assess something like, you know, uh, and, but, but see, and they're of like, you know, they don't have that, you know, they are not expanding their businesses, but India is right now that verge where, where, you know, like, you know, we need, uh, you know, big houses, we need more corporates, like, you know, like, uh, uh, and they're of like, we are struggling. So I believe that if this education system gets changed and, uh, the, the people like the educators, student, MBA students or management graduates, suppose, uh, they, they come, they go back to their family businesses and they start operating it scientifically, right? And uh, if, suppose they will do it. I believe that they will be able to enhance and suppose they will enhance. Certainly, I believe that Indian economy will go very faster and the length or the size of the economy will, will be, you know, uh, I believe that that will be more from the current level. So yes, corporate houses, uh, like, you know, they, they are, they are doing good because they have the best human capital and the small business houses, they don't have the best human capital. So this is the reason that they are struggling. Absolutely. Now, um, just a sort of an off take from that, um, there are a lot of emerging enterprises and entrepreneurs, um, uh, you know, coming up. So what do you think are some of the lessons that they must learn from the informal entrepreneurs that you covered? Mm, lessons, suppose the entrepreneurs, they take from the informal sectors. Uh, uh, rather, I would say to you that, you know, uh, I believe that uh, uh, first informal sector, they must learn from the corporate houses uh, of this objective of like, you know, getting, you know, uh, they have to enhance their level, right? Uh, they have to, you know, they have to be like, you know, very big, right? Uh, they don't have that dream. So somewhere they have many problems as well as, right? You know, uh, on the other side, you have asked me the question that, you know, what the big houses, big corporate houses, they take lesson from the informal sector. Yeah. Uh, I tell you the, that they, you know, like, uh, I do not know that, you know, you will accept this answer or not, but I, I feel that uh, they are still ethical. Small business houses, they are ethical, right? And uh, to large extent, uh, into big corporate houses, uh, we we feel that uh, there is a problem of ethics, right? To to that, we suppose we say to that, you know, uh, corporate governance, right? Um, yes. yes, it's like people will counter to me. They will say to me that you know, small business houses, even they are not having their formal accounting system, and you are talking about the ethics. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the ethics. They must be missing a formal accounting system, but mm -hmm. still they don't have that corporate governance issues. Correct. See, to big houses, into big corporate houses, the the money of the uh, you know, common man or you know the public's money, they it is there in, into their capital. And the small business houses or informal houses, they are operating their business by their own capital or either by the debt driven only, right? So they are really ethical people. They are they are, they they are they are serving the society very good. They are contributing to Indian GDP. They are contributing in the employment. Try to go rationally very good compared to the big houses. But yes, they are hundred percent ethical. To large extent, uh, whenever we find any example of failure of corporate houses into corporate governance, we feel really disheartened. Recently, one one big corporate houses like we we know that one big corporate houses story is into media these days. Like with one international firm, research firm, 
it is really something very disheartening because we never understand about the stock market up and down we don't understand something right you know so i feel that the lesson what big corporate houses must take from the small corporate houses or informal sector is that you know, try to be always ethical and try to be you know genuine for indian economy suppose the level what whatever you people are what this is my my take for a uh, big corporate houses Uh, yes and that's a that's a very um, very very interesting observation this question of ethics um and uh, that brings us to the management and financial education system in india i mean we would tend to wonder whether you know uh, ethics should be uh, reinforced and taught at that level um uh, so as as an academician who has taught in leading b schools like amity and cbs and mentored thousands of managers and entrepreneurs um what do you think are the three to four drawbacks of management and financial education system in india and do you think uh, you know ethics uh, like you said should be taught or reinforced at uh, that level itself what's your take on that uh, yes this is related to my personal uh, profile right you know uh, i served for business education industry around for 13 14 years i taught to a uh, few renowned business schools and universities right you know and you mentioned uh, mit and chandigarh business school right you know my personal feeling that what i still feel already although i am right now away from that system from last 7 years right but i still feel uh, if suppose i go back to my past i feel that uh, the biggest problem is that you know uh, what we all know the industry academy a gap actually we academic people are not much aware that what actually industry they really need we are not much aware and into financial education because i am i was into financial management education i was imparting that segment right you know and i was always feeling myself you know that see i i was not much aware or even i was not told by the industry that it shall be into it shall be into curriculum see into marketing or into hrm or into strategy like they are they are they are absolutely different from financial management if i am preparing a business graduate into financial management industry uh, you know like their thought process that he he is he is expert for everything he is expert for accountancy as well as he is expert for financial thinking planning control and everything but i am very sorry to update you that the syllabus the academia right you know there there must be a bridge between the industry and the academia especially into financial education segment and i have seen many students still i remember uh, they didn't have that financial literacy as well as they not they were not much aware with the financial technical jargons right you know and uh, to be very honest like two years mba degree program or pgd bm program right you know if we expect from a student that he must know how to make balance sheet he must know how to you know analyze the balance sheet and he must understand something about the technical analysis or fundamental analysis of stock market this is not going to happen this is never going to happen so we need to design this curriculum of financial management or accountancy uh, in a different way that student uh, you know uh, he takes everything and uh, he goes out as a perfectionist and he serves good to the industry these days like you know we are seeing new 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 domain like financial engineering forensic accounting right you know and uh, another fact which i really felt when i was imparting uh, like a, a student like who who was into different background into their graduation suppose he was uh, from uh, humanities or suppose he was from science background so he was not much compatible with accountancy or financial management because generally like if you are into financial management you must understand that this is the way to make the balance sheet you understand the concept of the balance sheet then you will be able to go for analysis of working capital or inventory management or capital structure or just to understand that you know shall i go for debt or shall i go for equity or uh, then you will be able to understand the technical analysis or fundamental analysis of your company right or profitability analysis so like th- there must be a uh, uh, like again a bridge between a uh, student's competency and student's thought process and industry's requirement because uh, like mba finance industry they feel that he is equal to chartered accountant he can do any everything but the fact is that 
this is really unfair. If you are taking a MBA chair equivalent to charter, there's a difference. So policy makers or education policy thinkers, they have to give, you know, I believe uh, a time has come where they have to give like their value addition to this segment, financial education. It must start from financial literacy and uh, like, see, uh, industry has to come and they have to sit with the academy of people and they have to tell them this is what I, we need. Then only uh, the segment will change. Correct. And um, based on your uh, observations, um, what do you think will be India's position in the global economy by 2030? Oh, interesting question. 2030 Indians uh, global position. Uh, yes. See, like uh, last year, uh, we uh, we reached on rank number fifth. When the, like you know, uh, Great Britain, like we 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 crossed the GDP level of Great Britain, right? You know, and we all Indians, we felt really very proud uh, because uh, Britishers they ruled us around for 200 years. So we are the fifth largest economy of the world and we are near to 4 trillion. And uh, I told you earlier that, you know, Japan and Germany and uh, uh, China and America, uh, and see America is 24 trillion, China is around 17 trillion. So I always, I, I feel I'm very, I'm very sure that, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this, the China and America, uh, they, they are far away from India right now. Uh, but 2030, suppose you have said to us, uh, I tell you the biggest strength of Indian economy into my observations are uh, the, the, the middle income group of our society, right, you know, and their consumption power. We, we do have that is, uh, you know, uh, you know an, an, a very huge number, right? Suppose you see the consumption of in every Indian on Diwali, right, the biggest festival of our country. Uh, you find that, you know, uh, like uh, uh, every year, like the data, when it, it come in the market, we find that, you know, uh, we are making every year new records into buying, into suppose into electronics or into FMCG or uh, into auto or into real estate or everywhere, right, you know. And uh, right now also we are doing very good into uh, investment segment also. Like you see that Indian stock market is suppose you take the Sensex or you take the Nifty, Every day we are making new records, like our Sensex is somewhere near to more than 60,000 points. So point is that Indian, every Indian is very well understood now that, you know, uh, his consumption is his strength. But on the contrary, COVID has given him a lesson that he has to keep saving as well as right. So taking both the aspect into consideration, I feel that uh, uh, by 2030, uh, I believe that, uh, like, you know, we'll be uh, near to $4.5 trillion economy, right? And uh, and I believe that uh, we'll be able to give a strong fight uh, to Japan and Germany. But on the on the other side, we do have some challenges also that you must have, you must have seen last year, this, uh, that American Fed, they increased their interest rates. And uh, due to that, like, you know, dollar was uh, very strong compared to our currency. And uh, we, we then, we, you know, like the, and the, all the repercussions, they came to Indian market because inflation was on a very high end. So India has to make a very stringent measures for uh, two meeting two things, one is the employ, unemployment, and second is the inflation. If we will be able to, to give a strong fight to them, I'm quite sure that uh, we'll be near to 5 trillion or 4.5 plus trillion dollar economy by 2030. And uh, one more thing that, you know, we have to uh, strengthen our uh, manufacturing sector. If we'll be able to do it, I'm quite sure whatever I've said that $5 trillion will be able to reach over there. Absolutely. And now that brings us to a very um, vital or a very critical aspect that we cannot overlook, which is the possibility of a global recession. Uh, now, what do you think are the possibilities of a global recession and how do you think uh, gig workers, entrepreneurs, and segments that you covered, as well as the common people in India and around the world, be prepared and look upon such an eventuality. Uh, right now, suppose, uh, personally, suppose you take my call. So I don't feel there is uh, any chance or uh, that global recession is near to us. 
I don't feel. Yes, uh, just three, four months, before, you know, like uh, previously we had this, this intuition or it was into media or it was into a discussion board that uh, when America, like, you know, they were, they were every day, they were tightening their, like, you know, interest rates because America had a different struggle uh, after COVID. So people were feeling that uh, because every every country's currency was, you know, they were, you know, with, with American dollar, they were into a different competition of value enhancement or depreciation or appreciation, right? And uh, they were having inflation into the domestic market. So people were feeling that uh, Americans' economic policies will take a recession. But right now, I don't feel that uh, this is in the this is the real situation. And uh, suppose I, I I talk for Indian economy I, that uh, uh, we are we are very we are very safe uh, because uh, our biggest strength that you know uh, uh, we are the consumption based economy and uh, we are yes we are dependent like on our imports but on the another side uh, our banking is very safe Indian banking is very safe and. Uh, this is the reason that uh, if recession happens, I believe that we'll be able to protect our economy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you said that uh, something about the gig workers or entrepreneurs. Uh, yes, definitely the consequences will happen. We cannot say that we will be absolutely insulated or we will be able to protect everyone. Something will happen, but uh, definitely entire economy will not be into that worst condition. But on the other side, when we look at our neighbor Sri Lanka, or when we suppose we look at right now with the Pakistan, what is happening over there, uh, and this is the, the, both the countries are struggling due to Chinese investment, right? Because China invested into Sri Lanka, and, uh, and the same thing with the PCC Pakistan China corridor, what is happening over there? Pakistan is into right now with the inadequate foreign currency issues, and same thing happened at uh, Sri Lanka. India is into very strong condition, somewhere around $530 billion plus foreign uh, exchange reserve we are pertaining. So I feel that uh, we will not have the, any impact of global recession. And, but I'm sure you suppose it will start, that it will start from Americans policies only. Last month also, we, we faced this uh, one soft bank, this one bank failure there at America in one week only, right? This, everything happened over there, that bank's failure. So America has to change the policies. And one another point that we are right now feeling that uh, the dollar, uh, the dollar, the, the, the global collection of dollars, suppose you find, uh, in 1999, it was somewhere 70% uh, plus all the countries, they had uh, the, glo the the collection of Forex into dollars. But right now it is somewhere 55 or 56%. So all the world right now, every country in the world, they are into, they are on their transformation mode. What they are feeling that, you know, let's make uh, a bond with good countries mutually and let's work together and let's come out from these issues of one major country of America and they are changing their policies and everyone is getting affected. So in my opinion, personally, that uh, there is no, there is no condition of global recession. And if it happens, India will be safe because our banking is safe and the consumption power of every Indian is the strength of Indian economy. And I believe that we'll be into safer end. And uh, uh, you asked about the entrepreneurs and gig economy. This culture is, uh, uh, now uh, it's 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 very often in India the gig economy and especially after the COVID uh, this is very often into corporate houses into especially into service segment so I believe that they'll have to suffer they'll have to suffer because uh, they are they are the outsourcing people they'll have to suffer uh, but right now I'm not able to point out to you that you know what will actually uh, what will be like the government's policy take for this but. But again, my point is that uh, India will be, uh, to a large extent, will be safe if, suppose, recession will come. Absolutely. Now, let's come to uh, Arthik Safarnama. What is the book all about? Tell us about your book in brief. Sure. Uh, this Arthik Safarnama, which uh, I already shared right to know, uh, this book, uh, uh, it is published by Bharti Publication, New Delhi. And uh, this book is having 252 pages. And uh, I have given around one and a half years sitting. I have been into research for around one and a half year. And then only I'm able to produce it. 
and uh, this book i have written into five segments mm -hmm. and i'm very sure that this book will uh, set a new benchmark uh, of getting uh, sense or knowledge in the field of economy or general awareness about the uh, economy or financial happenings right to you know in the first part i have interpreted the historical events of indian economy few historical events like suppose we talk about the green revolution suppose we talk about the uh, privatization reforms of 91 or suppose we we take like how we indians are uh, investment oriented and we always go for lic life insurance corporation and is suppose we 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 talk something about uh, this game cricket right cricket is like we say that cricket is the religion of every indian right so i have just interpreted all these facts that how these things have um, emerged as financial innovation into the indian economy how they have they have given like they have given a birth to financial innovation people have started earning out of all these things and uh, uh, through historical aspects i have interpreted beautifully i have interpreted for an instance suppose i i, I talk something about uh, green revolution so historically i have taken i, I will I, I, this book will take the readers in the past and they will say that what happened into britishers time and then when we got independent why we why we found this food grain shortage and how we started working on it how we made a bond with america and we had like you know we were importing for america and even one time time magazine at america they wrote for india that india is shipped to mouth that you know india is importing every day from america and ship reaches over there then only indians they are able to eat so then we went for green revolution and farmers they have you know the in in last 50 years farmers of india they have made us a proud country of the world that we are the largest exporter of the wheat and we had 70 years ago just we had short or you know short is so i have given i have written this uh, historical event into financial innovation sense that how the things have changed and in the second part as i said to you that around 10 categories of a common man uh, i have interviewed them and i have written their real life style i have interviewed uh, a taxi driver i have interviewed a vegetable seller or milk seller right uh, i have interviewed a farmer i have interviewed a government teacher i have interviewed a private teacher so i have spoken to them i try to understand how they are living what is what are their thought process you know and how they how they go for every day struggle what are their ambitions right and finally i have given them my words into my book and uh, and the third part i have uh, uh, i have written the challenges to indian economy uh from last 75 years like uh, unemployment inflation uh like you know uh this uh, the differences between rich and the poor man this uh, like you know in income differences and uh, tax problems and uh, many problems i have written around 13 chapters i have written to uh, uh in in the problem section and in the fourth section i have written the opportunities to indian economy like g20 right to india is heading g20 so how g20 is an opportunity to us and uh, recently 2017 india has uh, has come with this uh, this new tax reforms and gst has emerged and uh, emerged as a new way right uh, so i have written on the gst a uh, world happiness index and all these points and uh, lastly uh, in the fifth number category i have uh, I written something on global issues which are affecting india like sri lanka's issues pakistan issues we are more dependent on china right you know we are more dependent on america uh, uh, uh like in our in our country like we banned uh, you know like we have given destruction on many startups of china like tiktok and etc so how that happened uh, how that given an opportunity to indian startups and uh, equally russia and ukraine issues how they have given problems to crude oil issues so like few global issues also i have you know uh, i have uh, i've written in my book which are actually you know giving an opportunity to either the problems to indian economy so somehow uh, i tell you that uh, 252 pages and in the five parts i have written this book and i'm quite sure that if uh, 
anyone will read it you will find uh, a very different taste and one thing which i can promise that this is not a typical economics book because uh, i have given them you know a uh, very simple taste the language of my book is very interesting i feel simple uh, reader from a different background suppose he doesn't understand this technical jargons of gdp or employment or unemployment or inflation but i'm sure whenever he will read my book uh, he will love to understand what are these things you know absolutely i think you've raised some very um, interesting and very um, uh, insightful points in the book thank you uh, thank i'm sure that uh, the readers will uh, enjoy and be enriched uh, by the experience now that that makes me uh, wonder what you, what is your next project uh, what can we look forward to from you uh, going forward and <laughs> next project right now uh, I, i i i don't have any project i have not planned anything and uh, right now i'm just expecting that my this book will give me good reward reward in the sense like you know people will people will really appreciate my efforts i only wish that they will read it and they will like my concept and all the, on the another side uh, i welcome that i'll be getting some critical feedback people will let me know that uh, like whatever i have written suppose there would be any critical feedback i love to that even and uh, right now i'm working on the launching of this book and uh, very soon i'll have uh, a program for this uh and uh, as well as i'm already i'm constantly writing for newspapers uh yesterday only i have written one uh, article for a newspaper that uh, is there any opportunity that dollar will be replaced as international currency by indian rupee or by chinese yuan so i have written one article right so i'm 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 i'm, I'm writing only my, and uh, as you said into my intro that uh, i'm heading a school so two things i'm doing i'm a, i'm an academician so i'm an academic administrator so my first dream is just to give the best education for transforming of my students uh, so that they can serve to my nation and i i want to give them the best exposure the advanced exposure and second thing personally for me as uh, um, i this is my area economics and writing for common man's issues financial issues is my area so i believe that i'll be i will be exploring the same thing and uh, i'll be contributing best uh, through that for my society and if any anything uh, specific will come i'll certainly <laughs> let you know all that uh, this is what my project is absolutely we would love to know i'm sure that the book will have uh, a great impact on the readers and that will gain a lot of recognition so, so uh, not of. just in india but worldwide because your observations are very um, uh, i think they're very relevant even at the global level not just for india so so kind of. so and if suppose yeah. if suppose I, i i get a good response i promise that uh, i'll be taking this book into english language as well as i have right now i have right now written into hindi language because uh, my my target audience right now uh, my target audience i know that uh, they they are from this particular language yes. and uh, i'm 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 just uh, this is into my mind if suppose i get good response i'll be working uh, for this book's next edition into english language that will be wonderful because then it can reach a much larger audience and it can yes. have the desired impact globally as absolutely. well absolutely so absolutely we look forward to that you know when it's in english everyone can read and uh, you know i mean uh, we look forward to that i understand experience um thank you dr vora for taking the time to speak to us that was very insightful talking to you um and thank you for such a wonderful book also um thank you so much it's really great honor for me right you know and i'm so thankful to you uh, that you have given me the opportunity and uh, i'm expecting that uh, i have justified with your questions whatever you asked me Absolutely. and uh, if any way suppose i have missed uh, I, i take i sincerely apology for that right no, and, uh, i hope that uh, we will be again we will be interacting sometime in future as well as Right, Absolutely looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Prasad. Good day. Thank you.